All right, so when last we left off, we had, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, King Ahab was fighting against the Syrians. Ahab defeats the Syrians once. Uh, the Syrians say, ah, well, you, we lost that battle because your God was a God of the mountains and we're, our God is a God of the valleys. So they try again. And for his name's sake, God causes the Syrians to be defeated again by the Israelites. And at the end of this, we see Ahab spares Ben-Hadad, the king of the Syrians. And God sends a prophet to him, and the prophet says, you were supposed to clean this mess up. And Ahab essentially goes down to his house vexed and sullen. So Ahab doesn't do what God wanted him to do. And rather than changing how he acts, it makes Ahab angry that he's been told that he didn't do what he was supposed to do. So the next part that we get into concerns a pretty well-known story. What does Ahab do next? Okay, we have Naboth's vineyard. He goes out and he sees this nice plot of land. It's got a great vineyard in it. He goes up to Naboth and he says what? He says, I want it. And he, he doesn't just say, give it to me, does he? He says what? He says, I'll trade you for it, right, essentially. He says, I'll give you a plot of land that's just as nice as this one. I want this one for a vegetable garden, though. And Naboth tells him, no. It's gifted to me by my, through my ancestors by God. It belongs in my family. You can't have it. Now, what we need to understand about this is two things. One is, on the one hand, you have the how important to the Israelites was the land allotted to them by God. Okay, it was very important. What, what do we know about that land? What was, what was supposed to happen? Even if you had to sell your land, what was supposed to happen? Okay, at the year of Jubilee, every 49 years, 50 years, you were supposed to get it back. It was supposed to revert to your family. And in cases like we read about in Ruth, what were you supposed to be able to do at any time? Yeah, you could redeem it. You could buy it back. And if you didn't have any sons, what was the land allowed to do? It could pass to your daughters. That was a case brought to Moses by the, uh, uh, I can't remember who it was, but it was, there you go. So <clears throat> you have a case where if you had no sons, the land could pass to your daughters. This ancestral inheritance of the land was critical to the Israelite way of thinking. It was theirs. It was supposed to stay in their tribes, in their families. And Naboth is doing nothing unusual here in exercising that prerogative. But it makes Ahab mad. Why would it make Ahab mad? Aside from the fact that he's, you know, I wanted it. Okay, he's a greedy, sullen guy. Why else? What's the practice of the kings around? Take whatever. Yeah. It's, if I want it, I take it, right? You're my subjects. I can have it if I want it. So Ahab is running up against conflicting values. On the one hand, you have the Israelite values that say, we don't, we don't, we don't give our land away. It, it stays in our proper families because it was allotted to us by God. On the other hand, you have the godless nations around who say, you grab all the land you can get. Now, Ahab, being kind of caught between these two conflicting stances, just ends up doing what? Yeah, he, he kind of throws a fit, right? He goes down to his house, vexed and sullen. In fact, it's so bad that he's going to do what about it? 
he goes on a hunger strike. <laughs> he, he, he lays himself down on his bed, turns his face to the wall, and refuses to eat. Not sure how old he is, but he's king. Uh, that's If we ever had a president who reacted to being told something by going and laying down in the room and looking at the wall and not eating for a while, uh, I think we'd all have some concerns about that person being our leader. Nevertheless, that's Ahab. So how does, uh, how, do, how does this problem end up being resolved? Okay, his wife takes point. Um, and, and this is where along comes Jezebel to kind of make things worse. Now, we've seen this is about as far as Ahab is willing to go on his own. He's evil, but up to this point, Ahab himself is not a murderer. Jezebel certainly appears to be. Uh, because she says, exercise your royal power over Israel. What does that mean? Eminent domain. She views killing as a royal prerogative. All right. So she carries out this plot. And you'll notice in verse 8, it says, she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and she sent the letters to the elders and the leaders who lived with Naboth in his city. What's unusual about that? Okay, she's not the king. More importantly, what? What's unusual about that exercise of power and authority? Okay, they knew not to cross her, probably. You didn't usually see queens exercising this kind of authority, especially under a, if you had a king, if there was a king, then the queen usually didn't get to exercise this level of authority and lack of oversight. She just does this. Ahab just, I don't know if he doesn't know what's going on or if he knows and doesn't care or if it's kind of like, I, I, don't, I don't see it, you know. He's got the blinders on. But either way, she's making decisions in his name. And as a result, the guilt falls on him just as much as her. In fact, I don't think Ahab knows the details until after Jezebel comes in and informs him that Naboth is dead and to go down and take possession of the vineyard. So whether willful ignorance or circumstantial ignorance or he just actually didn't know what was going on, uh, Ahab is gifted with the plot of land by his wife. Now at this point, there's so many details of Ahab and Elijah's lives we're probably missing at some point. I don't know what interactions they had. But when you read the tone of Elijah's Ahab and Elijah, in verses 17 through 24. The word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, who is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone to take possession. And you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, Have you killed and also taken possession? Now notice that the Lord is saying to Ahab, Have you killed? So the, God is pinning the murder on Ahab, whether or not he was the one who actually signed the paper. It was done in his name under his nose, however you will, but under his authorization and authority. And you shall say to him, thus says the Lord, in the place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, shall the dogs lick your own blood. Ahab says to Elijah, have you found me, O my enemy? Again, there's this weird relationship between Ahab and Elijah. And sometimes if you just read the little tidbits kind of back to back, it almost reads like one of those you know, the friendly gangster versus the noir pulp detective um, in, in the way they talk to each other. Have you found me, oh, my enemy? And Elijah said, but this time it's different. Elijah says, behold, I will bring disaster on you. I will utterly burn you up and will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free, in Israel. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah, for the anger to which you have provoked me because you have made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel, the Lord also said, the dogs shall eat Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. 
Anyone belonging to Ahab who dies in the city, the dogs will eat. And anyone of his who dies in the open country, the birds of the heavens will eat. This is different. Elijah has pronounced broad disasters before. This is personal. And it says that there was no one, in verse 25, who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord, like Ahab, whom Jezebel his wife incited. I'm going to jump down very briefly to our application questions and say, what do I learn about that from King? What's something I can learn from King Ahab based on this reading? All right, we got Casey. I think one of the things you see in Ahab's life, uh, like you mentioned, he was a man of conflicted values in acting as both a king in the intent of God's will leading Israel and as a king like the other nations. And I think we see very clearly that Jezebel always has her hand on the scale, always pushing him to be a king truly like the other nations. And you can use David as a counterexample to see David is also a man of blood, but in a lot of times there are people in his life, I'm thinking specifically right now of Abigail, who counterbalance his bloodthirstiness with a side of temperance and mercy and grace that God seems to very much value in him. So I think the lesson that I learned from Ahab's life is to be wary of who you marry. Um, not only could you risk having a Jezebel, you could also miss out on not having an Abigail, but there's also a sort of a larger view of if you don't act, you can still be held accountable for inaction on your part when you should have been taking action. So even if you're not taking action because you're, you're upset, you're pouting, whatever, um, God still seems to hold Ahab to account for the murder of Naboth, even if it's done without his direct knowledge. Go ahead, Steve. I agree with you. I'll come back to that in just a second. Go ahead, Steve. I can't help but think, after listening to all of this, um, never to me has it been more true an example than evil companions corrupt good morals. And Ahab had the most, the most evil companion that you could possibly have, and that's your wife. That's your spouse. You know, I mean, continually instigating evil and being being nothing but evil. And Ahab would absorb all of this day after day, week after week, month after month. Be careful who you marry. Amen to that. I want to go back to what Cason said about tipping the scales, because it's a great point. Ahab's already evil, and Jezebel just goes ahead and shoves that down even further. David's already good. Abigail just goes ahead and lifts that up a little bit more in some circumstances. Who you choose to be around, choose to be with, not only affects you, but things that they do under your auspices can also affect you, as we see with Ahab here. He's not the one who wielded the pen to commit murder, but he gets saddled with it anyway. He's complicit in it. So, reality finally comes crashing down. Now, all along, I want to remind you that Ahab has listened to Elijah. He was there on Mount Carmel. He gathered the prophets up at Elijah's command. He never laid a finger on Elijah. That was Jezebel that tried to have him arrested. And now he does what some of us might think of as unthinkable. How does he react to this message from Elijah? Verse 27. He repents. He tears his clothes. He puts on sackcloth. He fasts. He walks around 
mourning and subdued. Not vexed and sullen, but actual signs of mourning. He repents. What's fascinating to me is God approves. Have you seen how Ahab has humbled himself before me? True story. Jacob preached a lesson not too long ago about God's reaction to Ahab. And I was studying for this already at the time, and I was kind of like, he, he, already, he already made that point. <laughs> now, now I don't get it. But I'll, I'll just reinforce it. God here, it's almost like a proud parent. He comes in, he says, do you, he comes to Elijah, the prophet, the one who is, he's going to take in, or, uh, yeah, Elijah. He's going to take him up to heaven without seeing death. And he says, do you see how Ahab has humbled himself before me? I finally got through to Ahab. All the things we did, all the things we said, finally something worked. God doesn't give up on people. Even Ahab. And sometimes if you don't get give up on people, you get through to them. All right. We're going to skip ahead so that we can get to the end of Ahab's life. Second Chronicles chapter 18, verses 28 through 34 details Ahab and Jehoshaphat going into battle. God predicts disaster through Micaiah the prophet. And Ahab says, all right, we're going to thwart this. Jehoshaphat, you dress up as me, and I'll dress up as you, and no one will know the difference, and we're going to fool God. And Ahab dies a coward, much as he lived. It doesn't work. And so God relented of the full measure of the disaster against Ahab personally, but not against his household. Because of Ahab, because Ahab humbled himself. He says, I will not bring the disaster in his days, but in his son's days. So, here we are at the end of Ahab's life. What can I learn from the reign of King Ahab, besides the things we've discussed already? i got a question for you. Maybe this will help kind of stir some thoughts up. Do you think that Ahab thinks of himself as a bad person? No. He clearly doesn't, right? Every time he's confronted with Elijah, Elijah is the bad guy. I think in his own mind, for most of the time, Ahab is convinced that he's fine. Elijah's the problem here. So, what do I learn about that? Go ahead. Uh, James, you got Mary here? Well, Elijah, like I said last week, and I had heard this in a lesson, these weren't really all my thoughts. I would heard it in a lesson, not, that, not here, but in another place. But anyway, that first of all, Elijah, I mean, um, Ahab, it says he considered it a light thing about following like after um, King Jeroboam. So that was his first attitude. And then, of course, he marries then Ethbel's daughter out of Sidon, Jezebel. A terrible mistake on that part. And yet he blames Elijah for the problems that he is actually bringing on Israel himself because of the kind of king he is. Elijah, I mean, he, when he, every time he sees Elijah, he blames him like, you're the troubler. And really all the problems have stemmed from him and how he's ruling his kingdom and what he's doing. So I just I think really we we can learn a lot from Elijah. We tend to kind of do that ourselves. We want to blame other people when things go wrong instead of looking at our own lives and saying maybe we're the cause of what's going wrong. And we might take lightly something we do, but if somebody else does it, you know, it's terrible. But but our sins might be light in our eyes. So I mean we can learn a lot from Ahab really. There, there is a lot to learn from Ahab, and, and I like what you said, you know, about that that idea of not be. We do have, we have to hold that mirror up to ourselves. But Paul talks about, you know, looking in a mirror and then looking away, and we're already forgetting what kind of man he was. And we have to be really careful of that, because holding that image of ourselves 
can be hard. And holding ourselves accountable for the things that we do can be really hard. It's a pretty difficult thing to say, this is my fault. And I don't mean in a, sometimes we get, we get into you know, that mode of self-blame where we're just blaming ourselves for all the problems, whether or not they're actually things that we did. I don't mean that. But I mean actually looking at something and saying, you know, I think I'm the problem here. That's difficult. What's the good news? Oh, go, go ahead, Troy. I got Troy and then Kyle. <laughs> you know, for all the things we can say about Ahab, the examples of wickedness, the warnings of evil companionship, here at the end of his life there's another example, and that is the mercy of God when yep. we, like the prodigal son, come to ourself in that moment. When, when we're finally able to admit, I was the one, this is on me. And, you know, in, in we find in the, the words of, of um, Micah, uh, Micah 6, 8, it showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. And when we find that humility, regardless of the uh, haughtiness that we've displayed before, it doesn't matter. When we come to God, he comes to us. You can always repent while you still live. And we're going to see that with Manasseh, too. And I think that's the biggest. Manasseh, as we'll get to later, might be one of the greatest repentance stories in the Bible. But here, Ahab repents. Will, do you mind getting Kyle here? Kyle Willis, he had his hand up next. Well, to me, it appears that Ahab, especially in his deal with Naboth, has no sense of fairness. And he's a king. And Naboth is... Uh, we're assuming it as his subject. And so his dealings with him, he was displeased at the fair answer that Naboth actually ga gave him. And then he um, says he was, uh, Back to control. he was displeased and heavy of, heavy of heart. Yeah. <clears throat> and then the, I think the other thing is he abused his authority. Absolutely. Because the responsibility on, for a king was to guard the seal. In the Roman Empire, there was a symbol of the person that had the power that Caesar had granted to uh, someone, for instance, like Pilate. He possessed an evidence of his authority by what was called, I may be saying this wrong, a legate, L-A-G-A-T-E. Mm -hmm. And that legate symbolized the man who holds this has the authority. <clears throat> the seal was also the symbol of of authority and he abused that by not securing it and not leaving not having the understanding among his subjects in, including his wife that it was only to be used because who had it ex executed his authority right so <clears throat> in that sense I think uh, those are things about him as a king and we see a contrast in the way David approached things of subjects versus uh, kings when he his attitude towards Saul um, <clears throat> that he would he would not uh, harm God's anointed you know th there's a it, w I think there's some practical application in what you're saying that we can think about if you are in a position in your life where you are you have some authority at work if you have people under you, first of all, God wants you to be a fair master. He wants you to, if you are in that position of authority, to be a fair employer or a good manager. In fact, it goes beyond that, though, that if things are happening on your watch as a manager or an administrator or an employer, to your employees or among your employees, and you don't stop it, you can be held responsible for those things. You, 
And so we have one of the, the I am man doing some project management now. One of the things that we have to go through as part of that project management is recognizing problems in the workplace like hostile work environments or discrimination or harassment. Why? Because if I'm the project manager and I see that and I don't report it, then it's my problem also now, too. I can be held responsible for it happening on my watch. That's a very biblical principle. I should be held accountable for that if I see it and do nothing about it. Here's the strange contrast of Ahab's life. Ahab is upset by Elijah. He's upset by Micaiah. But most of the time he chooses not to do anything other than complain. Then we have the false prophet Zedekiah that strikes Micaiah. We have Jezebel that attempts to kill Elijah on Ahab's watch. I think there are a lot of people like this. They're antagonistic to the truth of God and his word. They just don't want to hear it. But something happens to them in life. Something comes crashing down on them. And in a moment of clarity, they repent. But... And I'm putting that but in there because at the end of his life, Ahab is still trying to weasel his way out of what God said. He didn't learn his lesson. It didn't have lasting impact. We have to also turn and seek God and serve him. It doesn't do us any good to return to the same mistakes that we've made over and over again. All right. I have not yet gotten to Jehu, and we're already 30 minutes in. All right, what do I learn about God's character from the reign of King Ahab? If I had to give you one word, God is what? Merciful, long-suffering, absolutely. That is probably the big takeaway here, right? God is merciful to his people. Israel, he denies them reign, but he sends it after three years he gives them the chance to see his power at Mount Carmel. When Ahab repents, God relents of the disaster on Ahab personally. God is there just waiting for people to turn away from their evil ways so that he can take them back in the fold. He is seeking for us to do that. He wants us to do that. But on the other hand, God doesn't let Ahab get away with it either. He judges him at the end of his life for the things he's done. All right, any other comments on Ahab before we move on to Jehu? So let's turn over to 2 Kings chapter 9. I know we're jumping a few chapters ahead, but technically, temporarily speaking, we're just jumping a couple of years ahead to where we have Jehu. Jehu has intrigued me for a long time. The Bible presents us with a broad range of human personalities, and we can usually tell from the stories and from context uh, what God thinks of a person. All right, so Abraham is described as a friend of God. Moses saw God face to face. David was a man after God's own heart, and so on. And even though those men are flawed and were presented with problems that they had and, and stumbling blocks in their life, uh, we might consider Samson, for example, from Judges, we might assume he wasn't much of a righteous man, but Hebrews specifically lists him among the faithful. So, usually, you can kind of tell what's going on with people. And in their imperfections, we see God's mercy and forgiveness. And then we have people like Esau, who despised his birthright, and King Saul, who disobeyed the word of the Lord, and King Jehoram, who died to no one's regret. We know what we think about those people, right? And we often see in such men a stubborn unwillingness to listen to God, even when God is speaking to them directly through his prophets. And in their lives, we see a warning to all of us from God about the consequences of refusing to listen to him. And in a few cases in the Bible, we're presented with men like Naaman the Syrian, so impressed with being healed from his leprosy that he swears he is only going to follow God. He kind of tempers that in a weird way. What does he say? Yeah, he says, you know, there's this Syrian god, and my master leans on me when he's going to walk into this temple, 
I got to help him in there. Please excuse my behavior. I know that there's only one God. And Elisha says, go in peace. It's hard to draw any kind of real conclusion from that, isn't there? It's a perplexing way to leave things between Naaman and God. I think it indicates, again, God's long-suffering nature and his forgiving nature and other things like that. But you read that and you go, that's weird. <laughs> or that's interesting. So here's Jehu. Who has 2 Kings 9 verses 1 through 15? Go ahead, Jared. Now Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Gird up your loins and take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. When you arrive there, search out Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, and go in and bid him arise from among his brothers and bring him into the inner room. <clears throat> then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. The open, uh, then open the door and flee and do not wait. So the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. When he came, behold, the captains of the army were sitting, and he said, I have a word for you, O captain. And, Je and, <clears throat> and Jehu said, For which one of us? And he said, For you, O captain. And he arose and went into the house, and he poured the oil on, on his head and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I have anointed you king over the people, the Lord, ki <clears throat> sorry, king over the people of the Lord, even over Israel. And you shall strike the house of Ahab, your master, that I may avenge the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord at the hand of Jezebel. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every male person, both bond and free in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, <laughs> the son of ah Ahijah. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel. And none shall bury her. Then he opened the door and fled. Now Jehu came out to the servants of his master and said to him, Is all well? Why did this mad fellow come to you? And he said to him, or he said to them, You know very well the man and his talk. And they said, Is it a lie? Tell us now. And he said, Thus and thus he said to me, Thus says the Lord, I have anointed you king over Israel. And then they hurried, and each man took his garment and placed it under him and at the under him on the bare steps, and they blew the trumpet, saying, Jehu is king. So Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, con conspired against Jor Joram. Now Joram, with all Israel, was uh, was defending Ramoth Gilead against Hazel, the king of Aram. But King Joram had returned to Jezreel to be healed of the wounds which uh, the Armenians, no, Arameans, had inflicted on him, and when he fought with Hezeel, king of Aram, so Jehu said, If this is your mind, then let no one escape or leave the city to, tell go, to go tell it to Jezreel. All right, so here is, up here we've got the timeline of where we are. So you'll see there's Ahab, and then Ahab's son Joram reigns for a short time, and then we have Jehu. <clears throat> Our introduction to Jehu is a bit non-standard. Elisha tasks a son of the prophets to anoint Jehu and then do what? Flee. <laughs> okay. Starting off on an interesting note already, right? Go pour oil on the guy's head, say, you're the king, and then run away. The prophet is to deliver a message with the anointing concerning God's will for Jehu. So he goes in there and he tells him, here's what I said about Ahab. You're the one that's going to carry it out. Then Jehu comes out and he does what at first? It acts like it's no big deal. He's going to kind of pass it off, right? Eh, you know that guy. He's all oh, his crazy talk. And then the other army commanders, they say, you're, you're lying. Tell us like it is. We know we, we can handle it. As soon as he tells everybody, what happens? Hey, Jehu's king. Blow the trumpet. They all fall in line immediately. What does that tell you? Joram's not popular with the army commanders, is what that tells me. All right, so Jehu commits. But isn't this kind of a weird introduction to Jehu? So we have sort of this, I don't know, reluctance at first. But as soon as everybody says, hey, we're on your side, Jehu says, all right, here we go. 
And from that point on, it's like a, a switch has been flipped. And Jehu is our next king. He's ready to go. So now we need to look at some details of his life, because how he carries all of this out is interesting. Let's read 2 Kings chapter 9, verses 16 through 27. Who has that one? Aaron over here. Then Jehu mounted his chariot and went to Jezreel, for Joram lay there. And Haziah, king of Judah, had come down to visit Joram. Now the watchman was standing on the tower of Jezreel, and he saw the company of Jehu as he came and said, I see a company. And Joram said, Take a horseman. Send him to meet them and let them say, Is it peace? So a man on horseback went to meet him and said, Thus says the king, Is it peace? And Jehu said, What do you have to do with peace? Turn around and ride behind me. And the watchman reported, saying, The messenger reached them, but he is not coming back. Then he sent out a second horseman who came to them and said, Thus says the king, Is it peace? And Jehu answered, What do you have to do with peace? Turn around and ride behind me. Again the watchman reported, He reached them, but he is not coming back. And the driving is like the driving of Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. Joram said, Make ready. And they made ready his chariot. Then Joram, king of Israel, and Isaiah, king of Judah, set out each in his chariot, and went to meet Jehu, and met him at the property of Naboth the Jezreelite. And when Joram saw Jehu, he said, Is it peace, Jehu? He answered, What peace can there be so long as the whorings and the sorceries of your mother Jezebel are so many? Then Joram reigned about and fled, saying to Haziah, Treachery, O Haziah! And Jehu drew his bow with his full strength and shot Joram between the shoulders so that the arrow pierced his heart and he sank in his chariot. Jehu said to Bidkar, his aide, Take him up and throw him on the plot of ground belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember when you and I rode side by side behind Ahab his father how the Lord made this pronouncement against him. As surely as I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, declares the Lord, I will repay you on this plot of ground. Now therefore take him up and throw him on the plot of ground in accordance with the word of the Lord. When Ahaziah the king of Judah saw this, he fled in the direction of Beth Hagen. And Jehu pursued him and said, Shoot him also. And they shot him in the chariot at the ascent of Gur, which is by Iblim. And he fled to Megiddo and died there. All right. So this whole section... I mean, it just reads really interesting to me. But first of all, what's Joram doing in Jezreel in verse 15? Yeah, he's recuperating. He's been injured in the war between Israel and Syria. So he's there. He's recovering. Uh, who's Ahaziah? What's Ahaziah doing there? Yeah, he's the king of Judah, but what else is he? Yeah, I think it's... Is it cousin, second cousin, something along those lines? Um, they're related. And so Ahaz is there, just he's hanging out with him. And Jehu heads down to Jezreel to carry out the word of the Lord. In one of the more amusing sequences of events of, in the scripture, Joram sends out riders one by one to question Jehu's intent, and all of them end up joining Jehu's army instead. Uh, is it peace? What do I have to do with peace? Fall in. And they all do. I get the impression from that that Jehu strikes me as, he, he's a bit charismatic, isn't he? He says things and people just kind of fall in with him. Command, he tells the commanders of the army, the other captains of the army, hey, I've been made king, and they say, you're the king. He says, fall in. These guys fall in. They're, they're on the other side, right? And they just join right up with Jehu. So, <clears throat> the other bit that I've always found amusing, also the driving is like that of Jehu, son of Nimshi. He drives like a madman. From a watchtower, I can identify how you drive and say, ah, that's Jehu. Um, I can't identify any of you by your driving in the parking lot, so that's a good thing. <laughs> so Jehu meets up with Joram and Ahaziah. Where? He's in Naboth's vineyard. Yep. The, the scene of the crime, as it were. And now here's one of the more intriguing verses about Jehu. 
why I think he's so interesting. Jehu said to Bidkar his aide, pick him up and throw him on the plot of ground belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember, when you and I were riding side by side behind his father Ahab, and the Lord uttered this oracle against him, as surely as I saw the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons yesterday, this is the Lord's declaration, so I will repay you on this plot of land. This is the Lord's declaration. So now, according to the word of the Lord, pick him up and throw him on the plot of land. Jehu was a bystander when this prophecy was uttered against Ahab. And he took it to heart. He quotes Elijah. Exactly. So when he gives this order to his aid, it's not just, okay, toss this Joram guy out. It's, we do this here, because this is what God said. I was there, you were there, we heard it. So far, Jehu has taken an, for a northerner, for a member of the northern tribes here, Jehu has taken an almost uncanny um, interest in God's word and what God says. What's really interesting about that is we're going to get to it later, but it said that he served God, but not with a whole heart. But here, he appears to be serving God with a whole heart. I think there's some interesting lessons that we need to take away from what we're going to see Jehu say and do, and yet what's said about him at the end. <clears throat> All right. Was Jehu ordered specifically to jump Joram, to dump Joram in the field of Naboth? That wasn't part of the orders that he was given, was it? This is just Jehu remembering that was supposed to happen. What does it say about Jehu that he committed this to memory? What does it say about his character? He's at least God. He's at least God fearing. He's at least God fearing. I agree with that statement. He's prepared. Yeah. He listens to the word of God at least to an extent. We have to qualify that, because later we're going to see that he also doesn't listen to the Word of God. But I think that's what makes him interesting. We don't have time to get into 2 Kings 9, 30-37, so we'll pick up there next week. Thank you for your attention. I think the bell's about to ring in about five minutes.